Hello, and welcome to the course. I'm Jody, your host today, and I'm speaking with Professor Linda Waite from the Department of Sociology. Professor Waite's CV is more than 30 pages long and features many noted accolades, positions, publications, presentations, and research projects. I encourage you to check it out on the university's website. She is most notably the recipient of a merit award from the National Institute on Aging. Professor Wade is here to talk to us about her career path and how she became a University of Chicago professor. Welcome to the course, Professor Wade. I'm Linda Wade. I'm in the Department of Sociology at the University of Chicago, where I hold a George Herbert Mead Distinguished Service Professorship. I've been here since 1991, so for the vast share of my academic career. I came as a full professor and I've been here a long time and obviously I love it here. Well, from all the conversations I've had with people at the University of Chicago, it sounds like a phenomenal place and I'm sure they're lucky to have you and the students lucky to have you as well. So let's backtrack for a minute. We're going to come to all of the wonderful things that you've been doing in your work now, but one of the primary audiences for this podcast is undergraduate students trying to figure out what they want to study. So can you tell me a bit about your own early education? And did you always know you wanted to be a sociologist? No, I did not. I went to a small high school in rural Michigan and not so many of my graduating class went on to college. I was the only one in my class. There were about 75 students in my graduating class, and I was the only one who went to Michigan State where my parents had gone. And I tried a lot of things, and I didn't really discover sociology until I took it as a, an elective, maybe the end of my junior year. And said, wow, I really like this stuff. So then for the next year, I took all the courses that I could. I would have qualified as a sociology major with the courses I took, but I didn't have the other courses in the social sciences that I would need. So I decided to apply for graduate school. I was thinking I would maybe just get a master's and then maybe teach at the junior college level, something like that. I applied and by a stroke of good fortune, really, was admitted to the University of Michigan. They had a very large class. There were a ton of us. And that's when I discovered demography, which is my specialty within sociology. And when I knew that this was just a great fit, it's, you know, the statistical study of human populations. And I like having things sort of nailed down, which you can do with statistical studies. So I found that it fit my my personality, the way I saw the world. And I think that also sociologists and psychologists, probably economists too, are basically nosy people. Mm-hmm. I, I really want to know what's going on, why people made the choices they did. I'm less interested in what choices then, why they made them. And I still am, you know, how do people get to where they are? And most of my work is on intimate relationships, marriage, cohabitation, divorce, sexuality. So in the larger sense, I'm still working on those things. So going back just for one moment to that junior year, to your junior year sociology course that turned you on to all of this, do you remember what that, was it just an introduction to sociology or do you remember the professor? What was it about that class that got you so excited? It was a large lecture course at Michigan State. As an undergraduate at that time, there were a whole lot of large lecture courses. So I just love the perspective, the way of looking at the world, the part of the world that sociologists look at. And so it was just like an immediate (laughs) recognition I think. And I really, then I kept taking courses and realized that it was a perspective that just really resonated for me Mm -hmm. and that I loved reading this stuff. I found it endlessly fascinating, you know, the material we had to read and the lectures. So I guess what I could say to undergraduates is try a whole lot of stuff, see what it is that 
you really like that you're also good at. <laughs> because I also took some art history when I was an undergraduate and I loved it. And I realized after a couple of courses or maybe after the first course that other people could see things in the art that I just couldn't see. And so I was never going to be great at it or even okay. <laughs> I could enjoy it a lot, but so then I had to give that up, which is probably a good thing. <laughs> you don't need a lot of people doing bad art history. So I guess I have two questions. It's just sticking with your early education in sociology for one more second. Was there any publication that you remember reading or being exposed to at that time, an author, a theorist, like I said, a book or an article that you still turn to now? No, absolutely no. not. It's been a really long time. Okay, okay. <laughs> and I also read things differently now. Mm. I mean, one of the things that was a challenge for me was going to a school with a, a a large undergraduate population, a big state school, meant that I never had a seminar. I didn't really learn to write. I learned to take, no, I took multiple choice tests like crazy. But, I, you know, I didn't do an honors thesis. There was no such thing. So when I got to graduate school, I had a good grasp of this subject matter, but I was really totally unprepared for all the writing and all the discussion of all the topics that we'd read. And there was a lot of catching up for me and sort of painful. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I did it, but it made a, a tougher transition than it would have been if I'd gone, you know, to a small liberal arts school where we sat around and talked and wrote. Yeah, yeah. So was there a specific professor in your undergraduate work when you started taking more courses in sociology? <laughs> no. No, I mean, there wasn't so much contact with the professors. They stood at the front of the room. I remember a psychology professor who came to the sorority I lived in and gave a talk to a few people. And I found that interesting, but not as interesting. I don't like that perspective as much as I like the group dyad perspective that sociology brings. So... When I got to graduate school, there was one course that lit me up, and that was the first demography course I took. I was going to ask, so can you talk just a little bit more about graduate highlights, graduate school highlights, mentors? Yeah. So, of course, the first year, we had a very large cohort, and again, large lecture courses for many of the courses, even the ones that were topical because the graduate program was just so big. And it was my second year that I took the demography course, the first demography course, which was taught by Ronald Friedman, who was quite distinguished and a wonderful lecturer and was doing a lot of international on the fertility transition internationally, which I knew I wasn't really interested in. But I loved the methods. I loved the questions, loved everything about it. So that's when I said, okay, I know what I'm going to do. Really, I know what I'm going to do. And then I just followed the curriculum. But because Friedman was so such an overwhelming personality and presence, a lot of people worked on the fertility transition, contraceptive use, and so on, in particular in Taiwan, which did not interest me. And I became interested, and I don't even know why, really, maybe because I always wanted to know about the choices people made. It was a time when it was really the midst of the feminist revolution, uh, sexual revolution, the divorce re revolution. There were a lot of big changes happening. And one of the things that was happening was that women were starting to, some women, to really participate in the labor force, to have education and careers and lifetime jobs that were more on the male model of a real career. And I was very interested in what, why some women made that choice and some women didn't, because it was clear at the time, as it is now, that women have a choice that's mostly not available to men, which is to not work, that they can specialize in home and family. And it's, there's still a pretty 
sizable share of women in prime working ages who make that choice. So I was fascinated by the decision making, but there wasn't anybody in my department who was working on anything like that. And so I had to, you know, go on my own and cobble together a committee, most of which didn't know anything about anything I was working on. And my chair was Ron Friedman, who could not have been less interested in what I wanted to do, but he you know, read this stuff and gave me comment. I found another person in the economics department who had written a book on female labor force participation. Now that was the economic perspective, but he was very open. His name was Malcolm Cohen. And he was very open to, you know, talking to a sociology graduate student. So he was really, for the substance, really the most helpful. And it turned out, and this was just fortuitous, that I started working on this just as it was becoming a very hot topic in the field. Mm -hmm. So because just it was my interest and I worked on it, it sort of launched my career because I was one of the first people to publish in the area. I think I had an easier time publishing because it was a hot topic. And it was easier also to develop a reputation in a field that was new than it would have been to establish a reputation working on IUD retention in Taiwan. So that was luck. Again, luck. It strikes me because of what the topic of the research, in part, that's not something a man would probably say about his work, right? Like they would just take credit for it and keep going. But <laughs> I <yeah>. suppose that's <laughs> true. <laughs> but it sounds like really fascinating work. And it's a history that I know very well because my mother was becoming a physician at that time. And oh, was there. Was yeah, there you go. Old in medical school, you know, why are you here? You're just taking yeah. the place of a man. You're just right. going to graduate and stay at home with your kids. So. Right, right, right. So all of that really interested me. You know, who were the people? And Ron Friedman was actually very helpful in one way in this because he said, you know, people who can, the women who in this day and age can have a career and have a family are especially competent people, which was, you know, definitely a positive. I didn't hear from a lot of other people right. because there was still nepotism rules. So in the Department of Sociology at the University of Michigan, there was one faculty member, Otis Dudley Dumping, who was very well known. He'd done just foundational work, really pathbreaking. With his wife, Beverly Dumping, he was on the faculty in sociology. She was a research affiliate at a research center. Until the rules changed about when I was finishing, so the mid-70s, when the nepotism rules were found to be probably discriminatory and the sociology department made her a full professor. But when I started, there really was not much place for women. Well, I'm curious. I was looking at your CV a little bit and I saw that you didn't go immediately to academia. How did you find, can you tell us a little bit about what you did when you left graduate school and how you found your place? Yeah, so I think... In part, what I'd say I was a late bloomer, probably because I didn't go to a small liberal arts college where we sat around and talked about ideas. So I wasn't good at that. And I don't think I wrote very well. So, you know, I wasn't queued up to have a terrific research position. And plus, I was working on this topic that nobody really ever heard of. And there was a group at the Census Bureau that included people who were researchers. And I made some connections there with somebody who said, oh, come and apply. And I did. And that's really when I, where I learned to put together a table to write clearly and where I published. And this was really a coup, but um, a paper from my dissertation in the American Sociological Review, the flagship journal, and then the next issue, a co-authored paper on a new topic on fertility and labor force participation. So I was in the February issue and I was in the April issue, which is really something in the best journal. And that's when I was at the Census Bureau. And then I started getting calls from places about academic positions. So that really, and I made a lot of connections in Washington 
especially with sociologists who worked at the NIH, the National Institute for Child Health and Human Development in particular, and started writing grant proposals at that, while I was at the Census Bureau, which is also very unusual. So it was formational for me, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity. And I was there for two and a half or three years, something like that, and then moved to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign on the basis of these couple of really extremely well-placed publications. So I want to hear a little bit more about these big research, the longitudinal study that you've oh, been yeah. doing. Oh, and- yeah. Sure. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So let me just give you a lead in. My early career, I worked on marriage, divorce, young women's participation in the labor force, women's careers. And then I was sort of attracted into research on aging because there was a, I would say, a visionary bureaucrat. <laughs> That's not an oxymoron at the National Institute on Aging who was recruiting to work on aging people that he identified as having a lot of promise. His name was Richard Sussman. He had a remarkable career at the National Institute on Aging, NIA, and built this stable of wonderful people. And it was part of that. It was many economists, some sociologists, and I learned a tremendous amount. And that's when I started to work on aging, and I have been for the rest of my career. So the study that that I've been involved in knowing for more than 20 years, the National Social Health and Aging Project, is funded by the National Institute on Aging. And it built on work that had been done at the University of Chicago by close colleagues on sexuality and social, other social stuff, and it's linked to health, but on a younger population. So my colleague, Edward Lawman, had designed and raised money for the first nationally representative sample, that survey that looked at sexuality in the American population. And he was at Chicago when I arrived, and we became friendly, and his study made a huge impact on how we thought about sexuality. He showed that Kinsey was totally wrong on many things and really could ask about very personal, intimate subjects in a well-designed study, and people were happy to answer mostly. So we, motivated, inspired by his work, decided to design a study of many of the same topics, but at older ages. His study had ended at age 59, as if people didn't have sex after 59, and nobody had ever looked at older adults. So we put together a research group. We went to NIA, to Richard Sussman's group. We got permission to, first of all, there was still a lot of queasiness about talking about sexuality, but not at NIH which was really refreshing. The director at the time said, you know, anything that you should talk to your doctor about is in our portfolio because we are the physicians to the nation. Mm. So you should absolutely talk about sex with your doctor. And so it's absolutely reasonable and relevant research topic. So they stood behind us and gave us permission to submit for quite a bit of money. So we designed a study on the social world, including sexuality, close intimate relationships, social networks, social participation, social isolation, and other, what I'm calling other domains of health, like cognition and physical health and disease, mental health, functional health, sensory health, and we included in this two physicians on the planning team, which really shaped the project in, I think, a wonderful way. And the sociology group, which was Ed and me, basically, could do, could put together a team that would design the social, the questions on social life, the network questions, the participation questions, close intimate relationships. But the physicians designed 
what's become at least as important for the study, sort of a mini medical exam that we did in the home and for a social survey. This was entirely new. Nobody was doing this, but they designed with the team one hour of in-home, what we're calling biomeasures that were collected by the survey interviewer that included blood pressure, heart rate variability and pulse, height, weight, and waist circumference, blood, a little finger stick blood, which turned out to be very valuable, sensory function, vision, taste, touch, and smell, and self-reported hearing functioning, like how fit, how quickly you walk, and some geriatric assessments that are very common, getting up from a chair. And this was also, I'm not quite sure why we did it, but it turned out to be massively important. We get a complete medication log, including over-the-counter and alternative medications. People, you know, bring their pills and so on to the interview, and the interviewer writes it all down. We've done really foundational work on medications that older adults are taking. We have now a member of the team who has a doctor of pharmacology who has just done amazing things with these data, which turn out to be incredibly important. I just want to interrupt you for a second. I think it's really interesting because that concept of foundational research is something I've heard from a lot of your colleagues at the University of Chicago. And it's, I think, maybe something that people don't think about that much. Like people are very excited about, right, the shiny new (laughs) concept, but that data, and especially for a study like yours that's been going on for so long to have, as you said, that foundational data is so valuable. Yeah. And I'm waxing poetic. I say to the people I work with, you know, this study NCHAT changed the world. One of the first publications was in the New England Journal of Medicine on sexuality at older ages. And nobody knew any of this. And we had a nationally representative sample. And what it really broke open a whole field that has been really active since then. So that's very exciting to give, I don't know, the field a pathway into these areas that had never been explored. Yeah. I wonder how you feel as you're as you're moving on in your career and in your life about uh, you know, have you learned something personally from oh, this research? Oh, absolutely. That helps <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the reasons I do it. I said, you know, I'm basically a nosy person and I'm really fascinating and fascinated by how people make decisions, what decisions they make. So how did they get to this point in their life? You know, mm-hmm. what happened earlier or what's happening now that put them where they are? And what are the consequences? I was just talking to a graduate student yesterday about a paper that I wrote, I guess I published it, she said in 2009, but it's on the link between what we call marital biography and current health. We hypothesized that, you know, here we see these older adults and we see, you know, their mental health and their physical health and their cognitive function and sensory function, but We always want to know what are the things that push them to to where they are now. And we hypothesize, and we know right now, are they married? Are they divorced or separated? Are they never married? Are they widowed? And I knew from from some other work I did that these transitions affect mortality at the moment. People who transition into widowed face a much higher now because they're widowed a much higher risk of dying. And people who get married face a lower risk of dying because of this transition or in conjunction with this transition. So we said, well, okay, so some people have had these transitions. You know, they've been widowed, they've been divorced, they remarried. And we know theoretically, and we know from research that those are costly, that people lose financial well-being, they lose social support. They're very traumatic. Mm -hmm. And so there ought to be some shadow of that on their health. So we divided people by whether they were 
married, continuously married for the first time, whether they were never married, whether they'd had at one disruption and remarriage, two or more disruptions in remarriage, but they were currently widowed. And we looked at how that linked to their current house. And what we saw was just astonishing. There was just such a difference. And it really patterned people who had two or more marital losses, had worse health on every dimension on average than people who had one. People who had no losses did better than people who had any losses. And people who had continuously married were healthier than people who were in any other state, people who never married, people who were currently divorced or widowed. And it was just such a breakthrough. And what this student of mine was saying yesterday is, you know, that paper's been so extremely influential. influential. And, you know, it was just the next thing at the time, the next thing we were working on. But you never really know when the field is going to really pick up an idea and move forward with it. Yeah. Well, I feel like we could talk forever. This time has flown by and we've barely <laughs> scratched, scratched the surface of your 30 plus page CV. So I just wonder if there's anything that you didn't get to say that you'd like to say a bit more about now. Yes, I'd like to say a little bit more about NCHAP, the National Social Life Health and Aging Project. I mentioned that we designed it in the early 2000s, and it has been a panel study, a longitudinal panel study that's been, I think, very successful and paved the way for other similar studies. So we interviewed 3,000 people in the first study who represent older adults, community dwelling older adults in the nation as a whole. We re-interviewed them and their partners or spouses in 2010 and again in 2015 and added a new group of younger people. And we're just re-interviewing everybody now. We're just about to finish and have interviews with about 3,200 people who were in our original sample and are still alive and functioning well, those who are, and this younger group of people. And we're about to start a new project on this with the same people, the same data on what happens to people who are at high risk of mortality at older ages. How do their lives unfold? What causes what? How do they get to where they are? So that's really exciting. And then we're planning on going back to all of these people again in about five years and adding a new group of younger people to tell us about what aging is like now for the people who are starting to enter older ages. So it's been a wonderful, wonderful, I, the group is just terrific. And it's been, yeah, the most creative thing I've done. In my and that's a research team that you lead at the university made up of graduate students, postdoctoral students and things? Or The research team really is made up of a big group of physicians, big group of social scientists, social and behavioral scientists, and the students who are working with them. But the students come and go because they come in and work for a while, then they go on with their career. But the research team has been pretty stable, which is also wonderful. Thank you, Professor Waite, for your time today. And course takers, if you enjoyed listening to today's interview, please check out the other ones. Leave us a comment, subscribe, follow and share this episode with your friends and family. You can find out more about the University of Chicago through uchicago.edu or the university's campus in Hong Kong through uchicago.hk. Stay tuned for more. See you around.